appreciate those kind words. I guess they were kind, I don't know. I'm no longer in charge of potholes. I used to have the ability to put a pothole anywhere I wanted, so if anybody angered me, I could put a pothole in front of the house. <laughs> I still have connections. Okay. You know, when I, when I was thinking about things I was going to say when I got up here, I was thinking earlier today about how good it is to have these young men speaking on the lectures with us. And then I got to thinking, I'm up here with people like Weldon and Jack. And I began to realize I'm one of the younger speakers. <laughs> so, but in all truthfulness, I really appreciate our young men. Uh, J.D. I've known for 32 years, I think. I knew him back up in Missouri when he was a young boy. And it's good to see him grow, become a deacon in this congregation, stand before us and preach the gospel in a very capable way. Jonathan West, I've known him since 2007. I don't know how many years that is, but it seems like forever. <clears throat> and it's good to see him grow up and be able to preach the gospel and do it very capably. Jose Gamas, I mean, he's kind of young still, I guess I have to say. But what I'm saying is this. We need young people to step up. If I'm considering myself one of the younger speakers on the lectureship, we desperately need young men to look to the future and develop their talents and become deacons and become elders and become preachers. We need, we need all of those positions filled because um, some of us are getting pretty long on the tooth and uh, we're not going to be here all that much longer. A lot of us, there's fewer days ahead than there are behind. And uh, we need to look to the future of the church. And I'm thinking, by seeing these younger men and the talent and ability that they have, that at least in our area, the future of the church looks pretty good. And I appreciate each and every one of you young men and young women that are growing up and becoming good, faithful Christians. We need that, too. Appreciate this congregation a great deal for their Willingness to host lectureships like this stand for the truth for many years. One of the deciding factors of me taking the position at Fish Hatchery Road in Huntsville was knowing that this congregation was here. Because when you take a new work, you don't know if you're going to be there for 21 days or 21 years. I was very fortunate that it's lasted decades. And that's unusual for a gospel preacher to stay at a congregation that long. David knows that. But I appreciate this congregation a great deal, being able to be here, speak to you on this lectureship and on this topic. I was looking at for verses that would be good to read at the beginning of my lesson, and I think one verse stands out in the Old Testament, Hosea chapter 4 and verse 6, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, thou, uh, that thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of God, I will also forget thy children. My topic at this hour is the importance of Bible study, and I think that really says it all. People are destroyed because they have a lack of biblical knowledge. The study of the Bible is vital and supreme importance to the whole of the human race. To Timothy, Paul said, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. 
Timothy had been reared under quite favorable circumstances in that his mother and his grandmother were women of faith and they were knowledgeable of the religion of their fathers. Both women believed in and worshipped God according to the scripture. And they had taught Timothy the Holy Scriptures from his youth. The Apostle Paul says that from a child thou hast known the sacred writings which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Timothy had known the sacred scriptures from the time he was a child. But where is the child today that knows the holy scriptures? Where are the young people who know the sacred writings? Where are the older people to whom it may be truthfully said they know the Holy Scriptures? Where are the ones that are to teach our young people what the Bible says? Where are they? If you look out into the world, you can't find them. And sadly enough, you look at the religious world in general and you can't find people that truly know the Bible. And sadly enough, that same attitudes crept into the Lord's church and we find it hard to, to find our brethren who know the Bible. Even among our elderships and among our preachers. Our preacher training schools have left the faith. Our so-called Bible colleges have long since left the faith. Our children may enter first grade of our public schools and pass from grade to grade until they graduate and still know nothing about God's great book, the Bible. They may enter higher education, training schools, and graduate with honors from these and still be almost ignorant about the Bible as they were when they went in. They may enter the colleges and universities of the land and graduate from these with high honors and, and still know practically nothing about the greatest book in the world. Now, I don't mean to be critical of our public schools. Well, I, I am really, but that's not my purpose here. I'm critical for them for other reasons. Or our colleges or universities. Because it's really not their mission to teach the Bible or religion. They teach secular things. They're strictly literary institutions. One may indeed be learned and brilliant without having a knowledge of the Bible, but one is not truly educated in the truest and best sense as long as they're ignorant of the Bible. It has been said if you educate a mean man you make him meaner still. If that was the case, I'd be for closing down every public education center there is. However, while it is not true that education makes, makes a mean man meaner, it is true that an educated mean man is causing more harm to society than anyone else. Because when you educate a mean man, he has more knowledge, more experience, more tools, more wisdom to perpetrate his evil on the world. The fault lies in the character of this kind of education. The mental faculties are trained and developed while the moral factories, uh, faculties are go undeveloped. Our colleges, our school system aren't there to teach morals. We should plead for an education that develops one's physical, mental, and moral abilities. But such an education is impossible if we do not take account the one great book, the Bible. The Bible's left out of too many educations. And remember, we can't trust the public school system, even higher education, even those that claim to be Bible-based, those that claim to be supported and run by our brethren. We can't even trust them to do that job for us. 
We need to get back to what the Bible says. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 6, Fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. That's the parents' responsibility to teach our children the Bible. And even some parents who, who claim to be Christians think it's the church's responsibility to do that. All we do is augment that teaching. We support that teaching. Your children's education in the Bible ought not come from just what they get in Bible class two times a week. This needs to be a daily pursuit taught to them every day so that they can be brought up to appreciate God, the Bible, and the church. There are vital internal and eternal reasons why we should know the Bible as we know no other book in the world. In the first place, no one can know God without knowing the Bible. We cannot know God as, as He is without a Bible education. Oh, we may have heard about Him. We may know some things about God, but we can't know Him as He really is unless we know Him as He's revealed in the Bible. To Solomon, David said, Thou, my son Solomon, know thou the God of thy father, and serve him with a perfect heart and with a willing mind. We serve God with our mind. Know God, he says. You need to know the God of your fathers. How is how's Solomon going to know about God? How is Solomon going to serve God with his mind? From the... Areopagus in Athens, Paul addressed an educated and cultured, refined audience. And among other things, he said to them, I perceive that in all things thou art too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore you ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you, Acts chapter 17, 22 through 24. Now here is an audience of educated, culture, refined people. A people who spent their time learning new things so that they could turn around and teach those new things to others. This is a real learned audience. But they were ignorant of the one true living God who would given them existence in the world and who had provided with them every blessing that they enjoyed. It is possible today for people to be learned, cultured, refined, and still be ignorant of God from whom all blessings flow. It's not only possible for it to be so, but we are living in the midst of just such conditions right now. Many of the most learned, cultured, and refined people from a worldly standpoint are grossly, densely, and shamefully ignorant of the fundamental principles of God's revelation to the human race, and therefore they're ignorant of God. We wonder why our country is in the moral condition it's in. Well, there it is. We have a country that was founded on Christian principles that grew and advanced far above the countries of its time. And part of that growth and advancement was due to the fact that it was founded on Christian principles. But now we live in a time when people have gotten away from the Bible. They're ignorant of what the Bible says. And so now we have leaders in our country such as former President Obama that went into office promising to fundamentally change. America. And from that time to this, we see what we've come up with. When you turn away from the principles upon which this country was founded to worldly wisdom without God, this is what you have. To the church of Corinth, Paul said, 
For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 21. He says the world by wisdom knew not God. By its own wisdom, the world could not know God. We may truthfully add to that verse, the world through its own wisdom cannot know God. One may ask, is it not possible to know God through the book of nature? Does not nature in all its beauty and glory speak to us of Him who in the beginning created all things? But yet we look at countless heathen nations today, many of whom are close students of nature, but who do not know the God of their spirits answers to us a thundering no. While nature does reveal there is a creator, we can know that there's some supreme being. We can know some things about him. He's all powerful. He's all knowing. He's eternal. We can know some things about God. Simply by looking at the world around us, that's what we call general creation. General revelation of God. But without the specific special revelation of the scriptures, we can't really know who that God is. In the long ago, the Egyptians who lived on the banks of the Nile River discovered that as the banks of the river would overflow and left sediment, on the banks of the Nile, it enriched the soil and the lands, and it gave abundant harvest. But they did not see through all this and recognize the God of heaven as the giver of all good things. Rather, they turned around and worshiped the Nile. When ancient man began to study the heavens, he recognized the fact that the sun would come up, it would burn away the fog and the mist of the ground, and it would shine light on the world. The plants would grow. Did that leave early man to worship God and know who God was? No, they simply worshiped the sun. When the sun went down in the west, over the mountains, and the stars began to come out at night, and they saw the beauty and the majesty of the heavens. Did that point the way to God so that they'd know who God was? No. They simply began to worship the moon and the stars. It's no wonder, Paul says, the world by wisdom knew not God. There's just one way to know God, and that is to know the Bible. But doesn't David say the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows His handiwork? Psalm 19 verse 1. Yes, the heavens do declare the glory of God, but only to the man who knows God created them. The heavens do declare the glory of God to man, but not to the man who's ignorant of who God really is. And we can know who God really is only through His revelation by studying His Word. Does it sound like Bible study is important? This congregation understands that Bible study is important. You know how I know that? Because we're here today studying the Bible. They planned that out. They made all the provisions, invited all the speakers, did all the preparation to put this on so that we could come together in one place together and study the Bible. You know what? I'm confident that each and every one of you here today understands the importance of Bible study. You know how I know that? Because you're here. Right? You could have been anywhere today. But you chose to be here. Y'all know what it means to study the Bible and the importance to study the Bible. It's the people out there, outside this building, 
that don't seem to get it. And it's our job to get those people out there interested. We need to renew the world's interest in God and in the Bible. We already had two lessons today. One about our influence of our example. And one simply asking the question, are we going to be patterned after the world? The point was made, we can't be an influence to the world if we're just like the world. People need to look at us, see the difference, glorify God. That's what it says in Matthew chapter 5. See our good works and glorify God. And we need to be different enough and distinct enough from the world that they can notice that and begin to ask the question, what's different about that person? Then we can talk to them about the importance of Bible study. If we are going to be different than the world, it's because we love to study the Bible. We love to know more about God and apply what we learn to our lives. We should study the Bible also as a means of knowing Jesus, our Savior. We can know great and prominent men without knowing the Bible, but we cannot know the man Christ. The man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, Unless we know God's revelation regarding him. One day while Jesus said at the well at Sychar, a woman, a Samaritan, came to draw water and he asked her for a drink. The woman, not knowing him except that he was a Jew, said to him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, ask a drink of me, which am a Samaritan woman? Going back to the prejudice between the two people. Not the fact that she was a woman. Jesus said to her, If thou knowest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me drink, thou would ask me, ask of him rather, and he would have given thee living water. John 4, and the whole account is verses 1 through 15. Now here's a woman. She's been married five times. She's a woman who is versed in her own religion because she asks a religious question. Not only of her own religion, but that of her forefathers. But she still doesn't know Jesus. There are multitudes of people today, grown people, educated people, people who know their religion. And I'm not just talking about worldly world religions such as Islam and Hinduism and Judaism and those types of religion. But I'm speaking now also of denominations. There are people in the denominational world who still don't know Jesus. There are even people in the Lord's church who I would say don't know Jesus. I was up in Missouri at a congregation, found out that they didn't even believe Jesus was the Son of God, didn't believe the deity of Christ. That's the Lord's church. Do you realize you can't become a Christian if you don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God? That's the confession that we make. Multitudes of people, grown people, educated people, People who know their religion and still don't know who Jesus really is because they do not know God's revelation regarding him. The only possible way to know Jesus is to know him as he is revealed and the man who is not familiar with his life story as pictured in the New Testament does not know Jesus regardless of what else he may know. The Jews of, of Jerusalem condemned and killed Jesus. All because they did not know him. They did not know him because they did not know the scriptures. It's pitiful. It's pitiful that the Jews of Jerusalem took and with wicked hands crucified the very Son of God. They did it through ignorance. They did it through ignorance. Can you imagine?
Peter's preaching along with the other 11 apostles there on the day of Pentecost. And Peter comes, kind of makes a, a brief summation. And he says, this same Jesus whom you crucified, God has made both Lord and Christ. Here's the Messiah, the one they've been waiting for. Right? What do they do when he gets there? They kill him. Because they're ignorant of the scriptures. Can you imagine how they must have felt when that dawned on them? They killed the Messiah? Can you imagine their desperation? Can you imagine how they might have felt hopeless? We've killed the Messiah. How do we come back from that? Verse 37 says they were pricked in their heart. They cried out. They stopped the sermon. This was so important to them. They interrupted the sermon in a good way. I've been interrupted in a bad way before. But they interrupted in a good way. They cried out, men and brethren, what can we do? We've killed the Savior. What hope is there for us now? And because they were so ignorant of Jesus and his purpose, they didn't realize that he had to die on the cross. So that he could be buried and raised the third day so that they could be forgiven for their sins, even the sin of crucifying the very Son of God. Peter responded, Repent ye. And be baptized every one of you for remission of sins. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Then it says later in that text, with many other words, did he exhort them saying, save yourself from this wicked and untoward generation. They responded. They that gladly received the word. They were taught. They learned. They're serving God with their mind. They were taught. They learn. They that gladly received the word were baptized. The number was added unto them about 3,000 souls. There's no sin that you can commit that can't be forgiven. If you're willing to repent of that sin and come to Jesus for salvation according to his will. How are you going to know the will of God, the will of Christ regarding your own sin if you don't study the Bible? They didn't know. And these were people who were Jewish, who had been raised in that religion. They were waiting for the Messiah, but they didn't recognize him when he got there because they were ignorant of the Scriptures. How can we today know Jesus? If we're ignorant of the scriptures. So far in our lesson we know that it's important so that we can know God and that we can know Jesus Christ. Is it essential to our salvation to know them? The importance of knowing God is suggested and emphasized by the Apostle Paul when in writing to the church at Thessalonica he says, And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord... Jesus shall be revealed from heaven and his mighty angels in flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 7 and 8. Since Jesus is to take vengeance on all those who know not God when he returns, it's of supreme importance that we know the God of our fathers and serve Him with a perfect heart and a willing mind. The same advice that David gave to Solomon, we need today. We need to know God and serve Him with our mind. In Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6, without faith, it's impossible to please God. For those that come to him must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Do we need to know God? Absolutely. 
If we want to be pleasing to God, we must believe that He is. I've got to go to the Bible to do How do I have faith? Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Romans 10 and verse 17. I can't have faith in God and be pleasing to God without understanding and knowing the Scriptures. Jesus said in John chapter 8 and verse 24, Except you believe that I am He, you'll die in your sins. Then in verse 31, he says, if you, if you continue in my word, see, you've got to know it. You've got to continue in it. If you continue in my word, then are your disciples, are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Now let's go to John chapter 6. I want to read one more verse before we move on. John chapter 6. And I want to look at verse 44. And verse 45. No man, this is Jesus speaking. No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him and I will raise him up in the last day. Now notice verse 45. It's written in the prophets. And they shall be all taught of God. Every man therefore that has heard and learned of the Father comes to me. Christianity is a taught religion. It's a taught religion. We have to study the Bible to know about God, about our Savior Jesus Christ, and now we need to know the Bible in order to understand God's plan of salvation. Because it's taught. On the day of Pentecost, those people were taught. Some of them gladly received the word and were baptized. About 2,000. Later we read about 5,000 men and women. Later we read about multitudes. Later in the book of Acts we read about the, 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 uh, they were multiplied. The church grew and grew and grew. Because people were going about and spreading the gospel. Because of persecution in Acts chapter 8 and verse 4, it says that everyone went everywhere preaching the gospel. The gospel began to be preached in Jerusalem, and then Judea, and then Samaria, and then to the uttermost parts of the world. It's a taught religion. Jesus says, go into all the world and preach the gospel. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Preach the gospel. That's teaching. We should study the Bible as a means of learning the great plan of salvation. In Jeremiah chapter 10 and verse 23, Jeremiah says, O Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walks to direct his own steps. Man left on his own through his own wisdom, will turn to sin every time. In Romans chapter 1, Paul's over there and he's talking about the Gentiles and talks about how that they've corrupted themselves because they rejected God in their knowledge. What happened to Hosea's people? My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. The Gentiles chose to reject God in their knowledge. And God gave them over to a reprobate mind. The word reprobate simply means that their mind was broken. It wasn't functioning properly. Because they were on worldly thoughts. They weren't on spiritual thoughts. If your mind is not on spiritual things all the time, your mind is broken. It's a taught religion. We need revelation from God. To direct our steps. The psalmist in Psalm 119, verse 105. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. I can't know the way I should go unless God tells me. Think about it this way. If I could come to a knowledge of salvation without revelation from God, 
then I wouldn't need the Bible. I wouldn't even need Jesus. Because the Bible says that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by Him. John 14 and verse 6. He's the only way to the Father. And I can't know that unless I study the Bible. So I need to go to the Bible to learn the plan of salvation. God has graciously revealed the plan of salvation to us because it was an absolute necessity. We need to be like the Ethiopian eunuch in John, uh, Acts chapter 8 and verse 31. Philip comes to the chariot, understand what you read. He wanted to know the will of God. He said, how can I except someone teach me? He wants to know more about the Bible. In particular, he's reading from Isaiah chapter 53 about the vicarious sacrifice of Jesus Christ. The fact that Jesus bore our sins in his death. By his stripes we are healed. And the Ethiopian, who's this man speaking of? Himself or someone else? Beginning in that same scripture, Philip Preaches unto him Christ. He's preaching to him Christ. Some people say that's enough. All you got to do is believe in Christ and you'll be saved. Just faith only. Accept Jesus in your heart, you'll be saved. See, that's what the world through the world's wisdom knows. But through their own wisdom, the world cannot know God. Then as they went on the way, the Ethiopian says, See, here is water. What does hinder me to be baptized? He says, You have to believe. And he made that good confession. I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And they stopped the chariot. The Ethiopian had been taught about Jesus Christ. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that that includes the teaching of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus the third day according to the scriptures for the forgiveness of our sin. Why do you think that the Ethiopian asked that question, see, here's water, what does hinder me to be baptized? He was Philip was teaching him about Jesus. How do you go from teaching about Jesus to baptism? Especially when some people say teach the man and not the plan. Just teach about Jesus and don't teach the plan of salvation. That's what they're saying. But the Ethiopian asked that question which implies the fact that Philip began teaching about Jesus. And if I'm going to teach about Jesus, that includes teaching about baptism. See, here's water. What has hindered me to be baptized? Do you believe? He made the good confession. They stopped the chariot. They went down, both Philip and the eunuch, into the water, and he baptized him. They came up out of the water. The spirit caught away Philip that he saw him no more. And the eunuch went on his way rejoicing. We've got to know the Bible in order to know God, to know Jesus Christ, to know how to be saved, to know how to live as Christians, how to worship God how to organize the church. We could go on and on. These are just three reasons. We could have a whole lectureship on this topic alone. But my keeper's up here, and he's going to make me quit. So these three simple points ought to be sufficient to encourage you to continue your study in the Bible and reach out to the people outside these doors because they're the ones that really need to know the importance of Bible study. And it's our job, it's our responsibility to get them to understand that importance. Thank you.